Let me begin by saying I feel deeply honored to be able to speak to you today about uh, the, this, but Jacques Friedel, one of the great pioneers of solid state physics or condensed matter physics as it's called today. I actually had uh, much less close contact with Jacques Friedel than all the other speakers who have talked this morning. But and the contact I did, I always found very interesting and stimulating. But I had a lot of contact with two people that were mentioned as being very close to him, uh, Neville Mott and uh, Walter Cohn. Now, in my talk today, I had a decision to make whether I could should talk about my own current research, the topics related to that. But that topic is high temperature superconductivity. And you've already heard several talks on that subject today. And still a fascinating subject, still very controversial. So rather than uh, ex expose you to another viewpoint or related viewpoint on that subject, I decided maybe it would be more interesting for you if I looked a little deeper into one of the famous contributions by Jacques Friedel. So that's why I decided in my talk today to talk about Friedel oscillations, which you've heard about many times this morning, and to talk about how the recent or relatively recent discovery of scanning tunneling microscopes have introduced new perspectives into Friedel oscillations. So I would like to begin by introducing Friedel oscillations. And so let me start with the paper where Friedel derived these. Now this was actually Friedel's first paper. It was published in Philosophical Magazine in 52, but you see it was submitted in 51. And you re may remember this morning, we heard that he moved to Bristol in 1949, because of the war, etc., to start his studies. So this was just two years later he wrote this paper. And this paper uh, has had a tremendous impact. Uh, nowadays, of course, one likes to quote citations about these things. So I looked it up. It has about a 1,000 citations. Now, that may not seem to you an outrageously high number these days. But you have to remember that this paper was published in 1952, when the community of science was very small, and in solid state physics was very small. Of course, it's grown enormously since then. But the fact that a paper from then, that time, could still get, gain a 1,000 citations. And even today, last year, for example, in the Web of Science, it was cited 17 times. So that shows you that this paper the impact that it has had is not over by any means, but it continues to influence research. Now, the problem that uh, Jacques Friedel looked at was a simple problem in, in the sense that he looked to, chose a monovalent metal, like say sodium or potassium, where the wave functions are essentially plane wave-like, and he put in a positively charged impurity. Now, of course, that problem was not new in 1951. The problem had been around and discussed for quite a while. So let me say what was the state of the accepted state at that time of what would go on when you introduce this charged impurity. Now, since a metal, the electrons are mobile, when we have a positive charge, of course, the electrons will move in this mobile metal to uh, screen it completely. Now, prior to, his, to Friedel's paper, the standard approach was to use the Thomas Fermi semi-classical approach, and for example, used by Mott in a paper in 36. Now, in, as I said, you can treat quite accurately the electrons as simple plane waves, and so the density of them, since they're fermions and obey uh, fermionic statistics, the density of them is related because you simply, with plane waves, you occupy the plane waves up to a certain wave vector, to the highest wave vector. That's the volume of occupied K space, and that determines the density. The chemical potential, or the Fermi energy, is the energy of the highest occupied state relative to the state with zero energy. 
and that is mu here is given by then a square of Kf. So the density scales as the two-thirds power of the chemical potential in a, in a standard monovalent metal. Now, if we introduce this positive charge, then let me call the potential of this positive charge phi, then that, of course, shifts the energy of all the states, including the bottom of the band. So now, if we keep the chemical potential in absolute terms constant, because we don't, the electrons otherwise would move, would not be if, uh, if you had a net gradient in the chemical potential. That means the density, the, chem the effect of chemical potential measured now has this shift in the bottom of the band. And this is s different when, when we've done the chemical potential uh, that we started with. Now, if this is relatively weak, we can expand this equation. We get a linear relationship between the induced charge and this chemical potential and some properties of the, of the metal. Now, we also have a well-known Poisson's equation relating charge and potential, so we can use that also and solve for this potential, and we get a solution of an exponential, a one over R Coulomb-like potential, but decaying exponential because of the screening charge that the metal has moved around the impurity positive charge to screen it so that the net charge at, at uh, large distances that the other electrons would see is zero, the net extra charge. So the conclusion is that the screening charge decays exponentially with the Thomas Fermi K0 as the invert length scale. And so the assumption in this is the Thomas Fermi assumption was that the 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 chemical, the uh, density chemical density would be moving slowly with, due to this perturbation, and it was generally believed to apply, therefore, at large distances where this screening charge was small. But Jacques Friedel said, no, we must treat this as a proper chemical, uh, quantum mechanical problem. So what he did was to do just that, to treat it as a scattering problem, because now we have an, a scattering from this foreign atom. We have a scattering center in, in the midst of this sea of plane waves. So he said we must treat it. Now, there has been a big literature by this time, of course, on scattering problems to do with atoms and molecules, etc. cetera. And uh, so what's known then how to treat such problems. So if we then look at, we have the impurity atom at some place looking at an outgoing wave after it's scattered, well, first we have to look at what it would be in the absence of this wave, and this would be simply a plane wave emitted from an origin at r equals zero, and this would be the asymptotic form, essentially a sum of plane waves here in terms of the uh, angular, uh, principal angular quantum number L. Uh, now, when you put in a finite impurity potential, it, of course, was, was known that, therefore, this form changes because you get a shift of the phase of the sign here, so that, and that is associated with the potential. So, and the theory had been worked out of the relationship between the, the phase shift and the potential. But Jacques Friedel then showed that because of this, in this quantum mechanical uh, uh, <coughs> approach, you got some non-trivial results just from doing a scattering theory. For example, if you, if you impose the condition with a very physical condition that at large distances, the net potential of the impurity charge plus the screening charge of the electrons around it goes to zero, you found a, a condition on what these phase shifts must be. So the condition that he came up with is the so-called Friedel sum rule, which adds up, a, makes a sum over these phase shifts and gets the, a sum which is related to the net charge in electronic units on this positive impurity that we introduced. So this is a very useful and many cases in quantum doing electronic structure uh, calculations, people 
parameterize the potentials in, in, in terms of phase shifts. So this is a rule then that they all put in, of course, because of the physics that in the metal, as I said, large distances, you screen out the impurity charge. But Friedel then showed it also had another effect because in the absence of the impurity, the electronic density is simply the square of the wave function here. But now the fact that we have changed this wave function by this phase shift means that we will have a difference in the square of these wave functions with the phase shift and without the phase shift. And that then, when you expand it out, works to, comes out to this form here. That's just the case of three dimensions, three-dimensional gas. And what you get is not an exponential decay that was from Thomas Fermi, but a, peer, a parallel falloff, but also oscillating in space. And note the interesting thing here is that the oscillation period in space is related to a property of the electrons, this electron uh, liquid in K space or in reciprocal space, namely the, the, <coughs> the uh, cross section of the Fermi sphere to Kf. So this, this result showed that there, you could get information about reciprocal space physics. And since we describe these metals always in terms of Bloch waves or plane, wave, plane waves in the simplest case, between the behavior in K space and the behavior in real space. So that is the importance uh, of Friedel oscillations. Now, later, another way of looking at Friedel oscillations came with the development of many body theory. This came later, starting in the 50s and, 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 and later. The, that's to say, including the interactions. And in the, that approach, the key role is played by the dielectric, the static dielectric constant, which is a function not, a, a, it's not a function of, Q of just a number, but is a function of the wave vector. And the simplest form that you get is the so-called Lindhardt function, which is a function uh, shown here, which is a sum over at the bottom of the differences of the energies of K and K plus Q, and above the occupation, the fermion occupation number. Now, when you look at this integral, you see that we have non-analyticities in the integrand because this occupation number in for non-interacting electrons is a has a jump from one below Kf to zero above Kf. So you have Therefore, non-analyticities in the integrand, and this shows up when you do the integral in non-analyticities in the uh, result. Chi of Q is not a simple non analytic function. It, the non-analyticities depend on the, the uh, dimension of the space that you chose. So here in one dimension, you see it actually diverges. In two dimensions, it has a, <clears throat> a rapid, a, it's constant and then 90 degree fall off. And in three dimensions, it has an X log X singularity. But that singularity then shows up in uh, uh, when you do the Fourier transform back to get rho of R, it shows up in a singular long of parallel decay, Friedel oscillations. Uh, but the power you get then depends on this uh, singularity here. So it goes as r to the d. So that's to say, in one dimension where the singularity is strongest, it falls off more slowly. Now, th this, and one interesting remark is, as I said later uh, in the 50s, people began to understand how to treat the interactions. And a famous paper for, on interactions in metals is Landau's theory of the electron electron interactions. And a key result of that is that the Fermi surface remains sharp. Now, in non-interacting system, the Fermi surface, the Fermi 1 occupation number rules from 1 to 0. Here, it still has a discontinuity at the same place in K-space, but the magnitude has changed. But the existence of the discontinuity shows that this uh, Friedel oscillations 
are not just a characteristic of non-interacting electrons. So I said that in recent years, there has been uh, a big advance in measuring these real space oscillations relative to the earlier work. I mean, there was earlier work that we heard about from uh, <coughs> Lord Berthier this morning. He briefly mentioned work using NMR to look at Friedel oscillations. But the direct observation of Friedel oscillations was for a long time impossible because these oscillations, the period is in the range of angstroms. And angstrom is 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. So it is very a very small length, and to be able to measure things in real space on that length was impossible. It ch technically, it was just too difficult. But in 81, the scanning tunneling microscope was invented by Binnig and Rohrer at IBM in Zurich, and this was revolutionized this field because now you could do uh, a measure spatial dependencies on the scale of one angstrom. So the STM measures, what, what they did was they created this clever system where using uh, piezoelectrics, they could control a tip. You see here at the end of this is a tip with, down to a single atom, and they could move that laterally and horizontally on the scale of angstroms. So they could measure, they could, with their tip, they could bring it down and measure at a constant uh, separation what happens to the tunneling current because they can take electrons between here and the substrate system that they're exploring. The electrons have to go through a vacuum, so it's quantum mechanical tunneling, but you can do that, quantum mechanical tunneling, and so you can get uh, measure locally th how things change uh, in on the energies, on the length scale of an angstrom. So that, of course, encouraged people to go look for uh, Friedel oscillations directly with this type of apparatus. So I will just show you two results uh, two of that such work. You will hear more about it in the, in the next talk, about, more about uh, graphene. So this is an early work after the discovery of uh, STMs, and this is using a, essentially a two-dimensional uh, me metallic state. It's sort of like the metallic state that you have in an FET, which you then change with the gate voltage. So in other words, you, you get electrons confined to a near the surface here, uh, and, and so they're moving essentially two-dimensionally, and uh, they are bound to the surface. But you can uh, tune the um, uh, density of these electrons. So here is the result of a study by, done by a group in uh, Japan here. And uh, so they used this STM to look at, they grew some uh, indium arsenide uh, <coughs> thin states bound to the surface and uh, surface of gallium arsenide, but the, these details are not important. What it is more important is this uh, substrate had a lot of uh, actual defects, crystallographic defects, but they uh, acted like uh, uh, impurity, the impurity centers, charge impurity centers I was talking about. And so you can see they, for two dimensions, they got these nice uh, circular patterns. This was actually measured in the tunneling current. The tunneling current measures the density of states, and you can measure the density of occupied states by making the voltage such that the electrons flow from the substrate to the tip. And so you see then, this is a plot of it here, you see, see the Friedel oscillations. So this was a nice example uh, of an experiment showing the uh, Friedel oscillations. But what about uh, an example of it in another more complicated situation? Because, of course, these physics that I've talked about, it's in a simple model, but it's very general. So it's my last slide here is taken from some work of uh, Seamus Davis and his group at Cornell University. 
and he developed a machine, a STM, which scans a wide area, 250 by 250 angstroms. So this is an enormous area covering wide area of a, a, a high temperature super, superconductor, this BISCO. Now this BISCO is very dis, uh, uh, disordered, the surface, but it has the nice feature that the surface layer is representative of the bulk. So you, what you learn about the surface layer is representative of what happens in all of the layers in the, since the uh, cuprates are all layered compounds. So the picture that he got in real space looks, looks terribly random, you know, so you wouldn't know why necessarily what to do. But what he does is a Fourier transform of this. And when he, the real space pattern is very disordered, but when he Fourier transforms it, this is an example of what he gets here. He gets a whole lot of Q vectors, K space vectors, which are peaking up in the Fourier transform. So these are saying these K vectors are associated with some important transitions in the electronic structure. As I said, this simplest case, you would get the K vector, which would be the spanning of the Fermi sphere. So you would be joining two opposite sides of the Fermi surface. But here, the Fermi surface in this underdope cuprate that we heard about this morning, because of these pseudo-gap states, uh, that we, we heard about, uh, the Fermi surface has this curious feature that it ends in the middle of K-space, which is standard Fermi surfaces can only end at the Briand zone or be closed surfaces, but these are open surfaces. There are four of them, these so-called four arcs, and in the overdope region, they would go to the, to the uh, this is the Briand zone boundary here, they would extend out there, and in fact, you could redraw these four into a closed, uh, <coughs> almost like closed circle, like uh, it, it centered around here if you read, read, uh, shifted your origin. But here, they seem to end. And these p points here that he saw in K-space, you can relate them, as he does here, you can relate them to transitions. There are these four arcs between the ends of these arcs. And these are these, this set of points in K-space. So that shows you that Friedel oscillations and this relationship between structure in K-space and oscillations that you see in real space is used today even on the, at the frontier of science, particularly in this case of high temperature superconductivity. Okay, thank you very much.